most women start a business? Is it passion, money, or freedom? Welcome to Female Founders, the podcast that takes you behind the scene with women who are founders and CEOs to help you start and scale a successful business of your own. I am your host, Nagelia de Ravine. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Female Founders. In today's episode, I have the pleasure of speaking with Rachel Wiesenden. Rachel is not only the founder of a successful wellness brand, but also a dynamic entrepreneur who has dedicated herself to helping individuals achieve balance and a deeper connection with themselves. She has a diverse background in finance, sustainability, and Web3 space. Rachel's journey is one of passion, innovation, and impact. So get ready to be inspired as I dive into a conversation with Rachel. Rachel, what a pleasure to finally have this conversation with you and also my uh, condolences to you um, for your passing with your father. And I know that you are all into, um, I would say a little bit of wellness in, into you and um, mindfulness and the things that you believe in in life. So before we get started, I will let you start, start us off with something that can give us a positive energy through this entire conversation. <laughs> Absolutely. Nagilia, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, I am so excited to be here today. This has been a really long time coming. Um, thank you and, and to the WIMEL, WIM-led team for inviting me to come on today. So yeah, I figured we would do an unorthodox thing today on a podcast and start out with a mindfulness gratitude meditation. So I have here with me, this is a Tibetan singing bowl. I got this in Denver um, during ETH Denver this year, which is uh, we'll get into on the podcast. Um, but yeah, this lady said this was handmade in Tibet um, by monks who have like chanted words of, of love into it. So this is a really special bowl right here. Um, so yeah, let's let's get right in. So I have these meditation cards and this one today says acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Yeah. Wow. It's nice to, uh, nice yes. to slow down sometimes, just breathe in yeah. the gratitude for life. You know, it's, uh, it's important to slow down and acknowledge the good you have. And we were just talking before starting, like, if you don't take that time to appreciate your life and the good that you have, it can just pass you by, you know? Life is short. Life is actually very short. Um, when I read the Bible, I've seen people living thousands of years. I'm like, why am I not living thousands of years? I would love to live 300,000 years if I can. But Absolutely. unfortunately, we don't know when the last day will come. And uh, the yeah. small, tiny little things we have in life, learn to appreciate them, starting even with the people close to us, our children, our friends. Just sometimes I call my mom just to say, thank you for giving oh, birth to me. Oh, that's so sweet. I appreciate <laughs> it. And um, just do the small, tiny little things like that. It's mean a lot and to other yeah. people as well. And I thank you for doing that as well. It's a good reminder that uh, life is precious. Enjoy it and have fun with it and don't take everything too serious. But that gets yeah. me to um, want to know more about your journey. Because Absolutely. you turn you transitioning from the credit industry to become deeply involved <laughs> in the Web3 space, which is fascinating, by the way. Yeah. But what makes you make that turn that led you to this path? Absolutely. Yeah. So there's a lot to unpack there. So yes, I did work full time in the credit industry. That was my nine to five. Um, I have worn a lot of hats throughout my career um, since then. And just going back to what you said, you know, about life being short and what got me here. I just want to reference and, and thank you for your condolences earlier on the show. Uh, my father who recently passed away. This is a picture of um, me and my dad. That's him blowing bubbles for me when I was a little kid. Um, he introduced me to this concept called Ikigai. And if you listen to any um, like you know, podcasts, videos, talks I've done. I talk a lot about the importance of knowing your why. 
And this Venn diagram right here, this is a big part of what has led me to this journey. So just a little context there. I'll get into that in a little bit. Um, so yeah, I started out actually in New York. I was born and raised in New York, moved to New York City when I turned 18. I actually studied art. I went to art school. And if you look on the back Ooh. of my jacket, this is some art that I've actually designed, which is now turned into an NFT. We're going to get into Web3 stuff today. Yeah, this is um, an NFT I made. Oh, this is cool. Yeah, this is um piece of art I designed. So the whole concept behind it um, is just uplifting people through education. A big part of what has uh, led me to become passionate about podcasting and public speaking. It's lifting people up through education, right? Um, so that's what that piece is all rooted in. It's got Da Vinci's Vivitrum Man on it. So mm -hmm. uh, columns, ancient Greek and Roman columns on it. So yeah. Um, so anyway, long road to get to Web3 and DAOs. Started out in art school. And again, my father was an artist, so he really inspired a lot of my, my life's path. Um, so I went to art school when I turned 18. Started out making art, doing fine arts, and I, I majored in that. Um, painting, drawing, sculpting, and really used my creativity. Um, and then I decided one day, I started to really think about Ikigai, right? And that feeling of fulfillment, right? Like, what is my highest calling? What can I do to be of ultimate service, you know, in the world? So I made a decision to make a big change. I moved from New York to California. Um, and I eventually decided to start my own business. Um, if you see, you know, in my, uh, in my story that I sent you, my bio, um, I sat with this concept of Ikigai for a while, right? And, and drew this Venn diagram out. And for those of you who are not familiar, it focuses on like what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid for and what you're good at. And the Japanese believe that your life purpose intersects in between those. Right. And if you're off balance, you might feel like, you know, um, mm -hmm. not happy or not a true sense of fulfillment. Right. Um, so sitting with that for a while, I questioned, is art really the thing I'm supposed to be doing? And, and I was good at it. I loved it. You know, I was like, but is this really what the world needs from me right now? And then something big happened. COVID-19 hit. Um, so at the time, this was before I got into the credit industry, but I was out of work and just sitting with myself, like, what do I do during this time? And I really wanted to dive deep into like the introspection, right? And um, what I decided to do was sit down and draw this Venn diagram out multiple times um, until I figured it out. And I felt myself getting a bit closer, but... You know, at the time, and if, if anyone's listening, I, I'm a huge advocate for mental health, right? Like, um, I suffer with anxiety and depression, and I just felt foggy at the time. And I was like, for me to really get closer to myself and my life's purpose, I need to have a healthy body and mind. So I looked over at this juicer my mom had sent me. My mom sent me a juicer for my birthday. Shout out, mom, if you listen to this. Um, I looked over it and I'm like, you know, if I really want to figure out my life's purpose, I think I really need to just do a, a deep cleanse, right? Just a, a oh, deep yeah. detoxifying cleanse, you know, overload my body with nutrients so I can think more clearly, so I can be more present, um, so I can feel more joyful. And I think that'll lead me down the right path. Okay. So now I'm starting my juice cleanse, right? D day by day that goes by, I feel more mental clarity. I feel like my senses are heightened. I just feel like my body is getting all these things that I really needed, right? And I was like, this is a gift. And this is something I really want to give back to others. So in doing the cleanse to find my life's purpose, I ended up finding a purpose in that, right? I ordered some glass yeah. bottles and the whole thing, by the way, always rooted in sustainability. I never wanted to use single use plastic, always used organic ingredients. I really ran my business intentionally with mindfulness of the individual and health of the planet. So that is something from day one that was always a part of my values. Um, so I ordered the bottles and then overnight I started working with individual clients. I started deliver delivering juice cleansing packages. I got asked to vend at events. I became a vendor with my business and it just took off because we're, we're, you know, experiencing COVID-19, a global pandemic. And people want to get healthy. Everybody wants to build yeah. up their immunity. And this is in the beginning when it, you know, it was scary. We didn't really understand what was going on. So people are just like, I got to get healthy. So it took off. Um, I still needed to run, uh, you know, do my nine to five and do my day job. And that was when I was in the credit industry. Um, so yeah, I, I was working a lot. I always had that kind of like hustling spirit. You know, I like to work hard and, and to help people and make the world a better place. So I did that for a while. And then a friend of mine introduced me to DAOs. And this is when the story <laughs> takes a completely unexpected turn. Um, so one of my friends introduced me to DAOs and Web3. 
Um, and yeah, we can, we can get into that a bit too. Um, but yeah, that is what has led me to come here today and, and talk about DAOs, to talk about the potential of blockchain technology and Web3. Um, so really, there was a moment in my life when um, wellness met Web3. I was still running my business and I couldn't wait for the part of my day where at night I would work on DAOs with my friends. And I mentioned like part of my, my values and my ethos is really rooted in sustainability and doing good things for people on the planet. Um, so I found this DAO called Sustainable Development DAO. Shout out Sustainable Development DAO. Uh, they were aiming to like uh, bring carbon credits to the blockchain and help to support forestry initiatives, right? And like planting trees and, and really positive things. I'm like, that's so cool. It's like the merging of technology, sustainability. And then even with Elixir of Life and my business I was running, I created a little tiny community um, and started this chat for a wellness community in the blockchain industry. Um, so yeah, little things like that started happening. And I realized, you know, running my business by myself, you ever had the, heard the quote, um, if you want to go farther, go together. That's the quote, Damn. right? Um, so yeah, I started to realize um, with Elixir of Life, I was doing it on my own. Um, but then working in Web3 and working on DAOs, there was just this really um, fulfilling feeling of coming together with a community of like-minded individuals, yeah. working together collectively on something we're passionate about. So for those of you just learning today, a DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization. It's a fancy way of saying people come together and make decisions autonomously. There is no boss. There is no CEO. We all vote for the direction of the company. We pick a mission. We pick a purpose that we're passionate about, that, it, that is meaningful, that makes an impact. Um, and yeah, we go from there. And it, it's not rooted in you know, uh, a traditional currency, right? It's cryptocurrency. So we have ownership of our asset and it's a peer to peer decision making organization. There's no boss, which, you know, it, it's awesome to have autonomy over your decisions and be working with peers who are at your level. No one's above you. Um, so that is why I love DAOs. So pretty much DAOs, it's more like focusing into, uh, crypto. It's like a, uh, a money kind of thing, right? Yeah. So to be a DAO, there needs to be some sort of treasury or assets on chain. So on the blockchain, right? Um, any and, blockchain and, but, or are we talking a specific thing? It could be any one. So DAOs initially actually started on Ethereum. So are you familiar with Bitcoin and Ethereum? I know we might not have a uh -huh. super crypto crowd. So yeah, if, uh, Bitcoin is like, you know, the OG crypto asset. That's the first one created by, you know, an anonymous pseudonym, Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, so we don't know who created Bitcoin, but Ethereum was created by Vitalik Buterin. And, um, there's a book about the, the story of Ethereum I have upstairs called the Cryptopians. And Vitalik described Ethereum as, uh, you know, he compared Bitcoin as like a knife and, um, Ethereum, like a Swiss army knife, right? It allows you to have all these other little tools built on top of it, which we call dApps in the web three industry, decentralized applications. So that's kind of like, you know, how a phone has applications on it. You could do all these other things on the phone. Now that's kind of what Ethereum has done for the web three industry. And that's really why we've seen this boom and all these other projects sprung up. Um, yeah, a lot of it's rooted in Ethereum. And as I mentioned earlier, I brought up ETH Denver. So I'm currently working at Opolis um, as an independent contractor. So I'm an independent freelancer working with a, you know, Web 2 meets Web 3 company. Um, but our founder created the largest Web 3 Ethereum conference in the world. It's the largest and longest running Web 3 conference called ETH Denver. Um, we had about 58,000 people come out this year and it's just growing every year. It's wow. like the Super Bowl of Web 3. <laughs> But now let, let, let's let's back up a little bit more. Yeah. So <laughs> now when you're talking about web web three space, I'm sorry to say that, but not everyone knows what that is. Yeah. So now let's go a little bit more into detail. What exactly is that? I would love to. Okay. So we have web two, right? Web two is reading, writing, sharing. It's it's using the internet, right? Um, Web3 is introducing a new element to that, right? It's introducing ownership over your assets, which, which is so cool, right? Um, I'm sure some people listening have heard of NFT. I have an NFT back here I actually um, created. And NFTs basically are a way to have ownership, right, over over your art. It's creating a um, contract. The, the blockchain, right, is a collection of a, a distributed ledger on the blockchain. It's basically a public ledger to have transparency over transactions. It's not owned by any centralized entity, right? No big banks. Um, so this is basically a way to give people ownership of their assets. 
Um, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm <laughs> rambling on that. No, uh, no, 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 no. You are not because I'm. Tr- um, I love the fact that um, you can explain it uh, because not a lot of people actually understand this type of things. And even if they do, they don't really have the full package together exactly. to even know how to even get into it in the first place. It takes a lot of time and, and a lot of practice just learning about this stuff, like getting exposure in the industry. When I first came in, I had no idea what anyone was talking about. It was really confusing. But I said to myself, you know, I'm just going to keep showing up and talking to people that get it. Hopefully it rubs off on me over time. So it's really just like with anything in life, you just keep showing up with consistency and learning as much as you can. Um, and I'm still learning stuff all the time. You know, I'm not a very technical person. I'm more on the business development side and partnerships and community community building events. Mm-hmm. Um, the, as I'm going, I'm learning more and more and it's, it's pretty exciting to be a part of. Um, it just feels like this counterculture, right? It's like helping people to have more ownership of their time, their assets. And, you know, the organization that I'm working with, it's ownership of your employment, which I think is really cool. And we can get into that as well. Wait, you said the ownership of your employment? Employment. Yeah. So all How? this... Yeah, this is so this is one of the coolest things. So Opolis is a digital employment cooperative. So basically, we help people almost like a PEO. Are you familiar with a third party employment agency? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we help people who are working independently and we help people who are earning in crypto. And this is a huge help to push um, legitimacy of employment in the Web3 space and Web2. We have any, you know, all independent contractors as members. It's not specific to Web3. But why it's valuable to people in Web3 is because we're working in a vertical that has been viewed as traditionally non-compliant, right? Um, How do you pay your taxes with crypto? How do you know that you're doing things in a compliant way? Wait, 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 wait. wait. (laughs) You can pay your taxes with crypto? So I'll get into that. So with any earnings, right, it needs to be reported to the IRS because crypto, because Web3 is so new, they're still figuring out the laws and regulations to kind of figure out what to do with crypto. Right. It's, it's kind of the Wild West, as we call it. Um, if you if you know the SEC or Gary Gensler, they've been really cracking down on regulation to basically try and make it more difficult for people to trade with cryptocurrency in the United States. Other countries are, you know, mostly in support of it, but the U.S. has put a little, you know, uh, there's been friction points, to say the least. The SEC isn't happy about people having ownership of their own money and not using the big centralized banks and corporate entities. (laughs) Um, So anyway, that's a whole rabbit hole we can get into. Um, but yeah, basically in the U.S., it's been a bit more difficult for us. Um, There has been pushback from the SEC. Um... Yeah. And sorry, sorry again, if I'm rambling, I could <laughs> talk about this stuff all day. <laughs> but now, now, if we talk about uh, DAOs and Web3 space, so what's the connection between these two? I'm happy to go into it. Yeah. So DAOs basically have a group of indip- in individuals, right? And they have something called a multi-signature wallet. So, you know, a business has a treasury, right? This is the business's mm-hmm. treasury. Think of DAOs like a blockchain business. It's a business that uses a blockchain, uses some sort of cryptocurrency asset for the treasury and for the funds to be released or used for anything. In in theory, this is how a DAO, you know, should operate in theory. Um, The individuals vote on where the funds go. And this multi-signature wallet I mentioned, basically you need people to sign. Everybody and the majority has to agree this is where the fund should go to. And usually DAOs do this through having some sort of um, voting mechanism, right? So they will usually talk on like a discourse or like some sort of uh, forum, right? And someone will put up a proposal like, hey, I'll just use an example. We've done something like this. Hey, we want to host an event at ETH Denver with Opolis and, and Bankless DAO, another DAO I work with. Um, can we get X amount of funding to make this happen? We need the AV equipment, camera, you know, um, the venue. And then the DAO will vote on it and the funds will be released if the majority votes on it. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is actually cool. It's cool, right? Okay. I, I see the light bulb went off for you. It's a lot of nuances to explain, but it's really quite simple, right? It's a blockchain business where people have ownership and decision-making power, right? And every DAO does it a bit differently. They might have a different way of determining um, who the voters are, right? And some DAOs call them governors, so who's governing, who's voting? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've seen 
some DAOs that are massive. There's a DAO called the Constitution DAO. I think they had like 40,000 people. Wow. Um, and they, they fundraise like millions of dollars in a very short amount of time. So it's reducing barriers, right? Like DAOs are borderless, right? People from around the world can come together and work together from anywhere. It's borderless. People have more say and power of the direction of the organization. There's no, you know, hierarchical structure or paternalistic kind of relationship with your employer. Like you're all in it together. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yes, it is. Completely, <laughs> completely different. But do you think that most people are going to move toward that? Because uh, it's freedom. I, right? So that's a very nuanced question. So I've had someone reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, Rachel, do you think DAOs are the future of work? Um, I don't know that everything needs to be a DAO, right? I think there are certain things that might benefit from structuring their business that way. Um, yeah. So I, I think they're going to um, offer a viable alternative to traditional work, right? where people can work independently while also working with a group of like-minded individuals towards a common goal. Um, so I think they're going to offer an alternative for sure. I mean, for me, DAOs gave me the path to leave my nine to five job. So I didn't really get into the ETH Denver story, but I was working at the credit industry, still running my business. And I was asked to come publicly speak about DAOs because, you know, at that point I had already started nerding out to DAOs. I fell in love. Um, and I started hosting these events in Southern California and, I had no idea what I was doing. I just started some meetup groups. I decided to bring my laptop, make a presentation and start talking about DAOs, um, NFTs, Web3, everything. Um, and then I got asked by, you know, a side event of ETH Denver called DAO Denver. They asked me to come speak at ETH Denver and I hadn't, I hadn't publicly spoken yet. Um, so it was kind of scary, but I, I was at this crossroads, right? If I went to the event, I wouldn't come back to employment. So yeah. I was basically met with the decision. Do I jump into the abyss? Do I go after my dream and leave that job security? And I was at a point where, you know, I wasn't feeling fulfilled in that nine to five job anymore. So the fulfillment became more important to me than the security. So I made the leap and it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. And you know, I had an interview lined up with a major blockchain company and I ended up getting the job. I ended up, you know, being able to work on DAOs full time, you know, contributing on multiple DAOs and working on DAO operations for that project um, as a core team member. So overnight, just all of this abundance came into my life because I took a chance. I took that risk and just went for it. And anyone listening, if you're, you know, feeling stuck or unfulfilled in any sort of situation, um, don't be afraid to take that risk because what's the worst that can happen, right? You stay stuck in the same spot. At least you're, you're giving yourself the option for something new, right? Something fulfilling. But now how do, how can people get involved into all that? There are so many ways. So I think a big, a couple places where a lot of people in the Web3 industry um, kind of chat and have these communities, Discord is a big one. But to find those Discord communities, I recommend going on Twitter or X as we call it now. Um, X, looking up, you know, different communities. I think a really great starting point is Bankless DAO. So Bankless mm -hmm. DAO is where I've contributed. And now that led me to host and produce a podcast, Crypto Sapiens, through Bankless DAO. Um, so yeah, you just find opportunities like that. There's so many different DAOs out there. There's Bankless DAO. There's, um, there's a group called Near and, and Near Digital Collective, or I shouldn't say group. Near is a blockchain project. It's a, a blockchain protocol. Um, they created a project called Near Digital Collective, and there's little DAOs in there, and they all have their own purpose or reason for being or their why. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, let's see. I'd say connect with me on Twitter, Rachel Rose B, if you're listening, or X, sorry. <laughs> um, you can connect with me there, and I can connect you with a, a ton of different communities. Um, yeah, I'd say you know, just poking your head around, saying hi in the discords, joining the chats, um, starting the conversation. If you're listening to this, you could probably become a DAO contributor today. You just join, you show up, and there's a very low barrier to entry. If you want to show up, and you're passionate and you want to help, these projects need help. They need people to, you know, um, help work towards a common goal with them. So it's a very low barrier to entry. So now let, let's talk a little bit about your company. So I know sure. that for your company, you wanted to um, find your why. And that's the reason why you started your own company mm -hmm. in the first place. But what is the core philosophy that drives your work? Absolutely. So I can talk about Elixir of Life. So Elixir of Life just always made sense. Um, Nagilia, I told you when I looked over, you know, I was I was writing my um, my Ikigai Venn diagram and 
for those who want to see, it's right here. Um, what you love, what the world needs, what you can get paid for and what you're good at. I am sorry if that was a little bit blurry, um, but I drew that out over and over, right? Really trying to figure out what that was during the pandemic, just trying to find what is a thing that could bring me uh, fulfillment while also, you know, being of service to the world and, and providing something that the world actually needs. Um, so I started doing my juice cleanse and every day I just felt more clear. I felt more joyful, more focused. And I was like, this is such a special gift. I want to, I want to give this to others. Right. Um, so I ordered glass bottles and like I mentioned, sustainability was always at the root of it too, because we can't have uh, healthy people if we have a sick planet. Right. Yes. So we need to build a symbiotic relationship with the planet. Yes. And on my jacket here, I had this design by my, my friend, I designed this on Canva and, um, <laughs> My designer friend, Little Fresh Sam, made this for me. So if you see on this arm, it's kind of hard to read, but it says regenerate. And this side says collaborate. Collaborate. So regenerate, right? Creating regenerative systems that sustain life on this planet, help people get healthy and help our planet to, um, you know, stay healthy as well. And then collaborate because we can't do it alone. We have to do it together. Mm -hmm. And then this on the back is the artwork for like uplifting people through education. So that those are kind of like my core values that I live by regeneration, collaboration and education. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm <laughs> going on another <laughs> rant. There. But um, I know that the company offers um, a range of products that promote well-being. Can you tell us more about them? Yeah, absolutely. And I, am, am I able to share my screen at all? Oh, fortunately not. Okay, so I'll just go over it then. So I have a website my UX and UI designer put together uh, for Elixir of Life. And what it says basically is that we source sustainable ingredients, right? All organic, non-genetically modified ingredients without any use of single-use plastic. So how cool is that? It's a reusable resource. I've had so clients that use the bottles over and over again for their personal use, or they bring it back to me for my bottle exchange program and, and return them and get new products. Um, now with Elixir of Life, because of the nature of the product, right? It's an organic juice, it's an organic smoothie or a wellness shot. So those are perishable goods. And when I was running the business, what I experienced is that, um, there's, there's a scalability, um, thing that limit there, right? So I got my products in some stores in Southern California. Nice Guys is one of them. Uh, another store is Organic Junkie in Riverside. Um, so I started getting my products in stores and there's a lot of work as an individual. I was running my business on my own, hired people here and there for events for vending, but for the most part on my own. Um, I realized scalability wise, it was really difficult. You really um, can only go so far alone, right? Yeah. Um, so something I've been thinking about lately, and, and this is actually some in web three, we call it alpha. Uh, this is the first time I'm really saying this on a podcast or on a public, uh, medium. Um, what I've been thinking about lately is going into, uh, making superfood powders. So because mm. we hit the wall with scalability, right? With juices and smoothies, what I'm thinking is we create these superfood powders in biodegradable packaging. So it sticks with the ethos of sustainability, right? No use of single use plastic organic, high quality, intentionally sourced ingredients, right? That way we can start like an e-store and, and ship these things online and scale it and help more people. Cause I've had my mom in New York, I'm in California now. My mom's wanted juices before her friends have wanted juices and smoothies. They wanted cleansing packages. And I'm like, uh, how do I make this and like send it over there? I don't even, it's, you know, got a shelf life of three to five days. So yeah, um, I, I think with the superfood powders, that has the potential to reach more people, right? While still embodying the ethos of elixir of life, you know, um, helping people get healthy, helping the planet stay healthy and, you know, creating that symbiotic relationship. But now when you when we talk about uh, the smoothie, so you do you make them, are they like homemade? Uh, um, so and then you deliver it to the store? So I did start doing it that way, but when it became a commercial product, right? When it was sold in stores, I had to make it in a health department, um, like uh, approved kitchen, right? So I started making them in the stores, um, in their kitchen. So I was able to use the kitchens in the stores to make them. Um, because when it's being sold commercially for public consumption, you need to list all the ingredients and it has to be made in a health department kitchen. Um, so I started out hustling on my own, you know, like selling to friends, bringing to events, vending. When it got to the point of commercial sale, that's when I had to really get serious and start making it out of those commercial kitchens. 
But when you make it in the commercial kitchen, do, do you need to, uh, whatever you make need to be sell the same day or they can also sell the next day? How does that work? So they usually didn't last that long, to be honest. They usually didn't last over a couple of days. Um, they would sell out pretty quickly. It, the demand for the smoothies and juices was always more than I could make as one person. Um, so when you, when you think of juicing, have you ever juiced or made a juice or a smoothie before? Mm -hmm. So the juicing requires a lot of produce, a lot of produce yes. to make a single. And I could share pictures maybe in the uh, magazine article or with you. Um, I have a picture of like an array of my juices I made. Um, there was actually someone who was working on a Diplo music video set and they requested two of everything on my menu, right? Except for beet juice. So I made everything on my menu and it was like, it was an all night endeavor, um, peeling, cutting, for one carrot juice, it took 30 carrots just for one wow. carrot juice. So imagine that's just one juice and they wanted two of everything on my menu. So imagine all the peeling, the cutting, the hours of like manual labor that goes into that. And then you got to wash the equipment and you got to thoroughly clean it between each thing. Right. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a lot to do as a single person, you know? Um, and I think the solution for that, and yeah, this is again, my first time talking about this in a, in a public medium. Um, I, I really want to go eventually into superfood powders, you know, so I can ship them to people and help people get healthy while being mindful of sustainability. Another thing with elixir of life, I mentioned this in my bio is, um, you know, helping to give back to nonprofits and elixir of life is rooted in alchemy. It's, it's rooted in combining what we have on this planet to sustain life and help to cure illnesses. This was made during the pandemic, right? Um, yes. So I really wanted to have the theme of alchemy to it and also elements, right? So every quarter I had thought of this idea of like rotating to a different nonprofit with respect to the elements, right? Like let's give back to planting trees. Let's give back, you know, helping to repair from these wildfires we're experiencing around the world. Um, you know, let's give back to our oceans, protect like, you know, MPAs, marine protected environments and ocean cleanups. So yeah, I did a lot with my business, like going to ocean cleanups and, you know, donating products to volunteers and, you know, helping with nonprofits is something like it just always clicked in my brain. Like, how can we be healthy if our planet's sick? We have to build that relation, that symbiotic relationship, right, with our planet. So that was always rooted in my ethos and, and my values. But now you also um, have your a podcast. So can you tell us about it? Yeah. So I know it's, it's a long leap from elixir of life to crypto sapiens. A couple of years have gone by. Um, so yeah, crypto sapiens is, um, basically a connection I made through bankless DAO. So I started showing up for bankless DAO community calls and doing work with their community. Eventually I met Humpty, shout out Humpty Calderon from crypto sapiens. Um, and he said they needed a host for their season eight, a host and producer for their season eight. Um, I had never done a podcast before, but what I had started doing was publicly speaking. I've traveled around the world and talked about this stuff. You know, I've spoken in Paris. I've spoken in Toronto, Denver. Um, you know, I, I've traveled all around and hosted a plethora of events in California and San, uh, San Francisco. So, you know, I, I really started to feel like I think I'm ready for this. Right. It's an, it's the next chapter because I had publicly spoken. I got that down. I was, um, hosting Twitter spaces for over a year, right? Hosting community building um, spaces. So I was like, I got this, I can do it. And then getting into podcasting, I realized you think it's going to be this much work and it's like that much work, right? <laughs> um, Cause you have to do the AV, the editing, you have video, you have, you know, we have to get it on Podbeam, Spotify, Apple music, and there's all this work that goes into it. Um, I have learned so much about myself through this experience and the crypto sapiens team is so amazing. They actually, uh, Humpty gave me this mug. It says GM crypto sapiens. <laughs> so little context about GM. So those of us who work in web three, you see this everywhere, GM. And what this means, you know, it stands for, of course, good morning, but in crypto, it's, it's more of a saying of like, we're early, right? We're early to this revolution, GM. Like it's never too late for a GM in, in crypto and web three. So yeah. Anyway, coming back to crypto sapiens, it's been amazing. It's been an amazing learning experience. I'm so, so grateful for the team. It's taught me so much. We're getting to the end of season eight and I can also share a little bit of news that's coming out here first as well. Um, at my event at the University of Southern, Southern California this weekend, I connected with one of the actors from Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. Uh, if anyone is familiar with Daniel Moncada, 
Um, so Daniel and I really hit it off and he's going to be coming on to Crypto Sapiens as a guest. Uh, he's working on his Web3 project. So this is going to be like Breaking Bad meets Web3 on Crypto Sapiens. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Yeah. I can talk to you all day long. <laughs> I know. I, there's, there's just so much to unpack. And, um, yeah, I, I'm really just grateful for all the things I've got to do, gotten to do in my career. Um, most recently, you know, really getting into the public speaking, traveling. I got to speak in Paris about DAOs, just like, um, so many amazing opportunities have come my way. And it really stems from just being rooted in, in my passion, right? Um, yes. And just going after what I want to do in life, you know, like like we said in the beginning, life is short. Life is short. For for individuals who are looking to enter the Web on three space, what advice do you um do you have based on your journey and experience? Uh, are there any skills or mindset uh, that you consider important for success? Yeah, the mindset I would say is remain teachable because there's so much to learn. Ask questions. Don't ever feel dumb for asking questions because there's, it, it's such a complex, um, such a complex space to, to grasp. I'd say always remain, um, passionate, ask questions, remain teachable, right? Um, but I'd say if you have, um, the people skills, right? If you can show up and if you're good with people, um, and you're passionate, if you're a passionate person who's willing to put the work in, I think you can go in any direction in life That's you want. Cool, yeah. Um, this for me just happened to make a lot of sense. And, um, I will show two more books. I'm a bookworm. So I have some books here to reference. Um, this book right here, the decision making employee, this was written by my former colleague, Devin Marty. So he wrote a book on how to succeed in a decentralized organization. This can be bought on Amazon. And, and this is a, a book that has really taught me a lot about working with people in a more decentralized way. And this book right here, my newest book, The Tiger and the Rabbit, this is harnessing the power of metaverse, Web3, and AI for business success. So any of my business folks out there, this is a good one. Um, and there is a quote from here about DAOs I would love to share. Um, DAOs are here to give power back to the people. Decentralized decision-making and transparent governance are the new kids on the block, and they're not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> so that is it. Uh, one of my podcast guests, actually, Sandy Carter, um, amazing person. I think she has like three or four best selling books, former AWS executive, just a powerhouse of a person. Shout out to Sandy. She's amazing. <laughs> so before I let you go, to, before I let you go today, Rachel, um, where can our listeners connect with you to learn more about your work, uh, get advice from you about uh, downs and also Web3 space, but also about your company and listen to your podcast and just maybe just say hi. Absolutely. So there's a couple places. Um, are we going to have like a description in, in the video or podcast? Okay. So I'll drop some links. Number one is going to be my link tree. So my link tree links out to my LinkedIn, to my Telegram, to my Twitter. You can follow me on Twitter or reach out to me on Telegram. It's at Rachel Rose B. Um, on LinkedIn, you can find me, Rachel Brissenden. And by the time this goes out, this episode is out, my website will be live, rachelbrissenden.com. And we'll spell that in the description for you. Um, to find Crypto Sapiens, look at Crypto Sapiens on YouTube. Um, you'll see my face on the season eight playlist. Um, and also, if you want to look into Opolis, Opolis is a platform for independent workers and freelancers and solo entrepreneurs. So if you're looking into to diving into the world of freelancing and you want to learn how to get set up with things like, you know, if you're in the US, W2s, pay stubs, benefits, we can help you out there. So yeah, you can find me, Rachel Rose B on Twitter or the other resources I shared. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel, <laughs> for sharing your incredible journey Absolutely. and insight with me today. Your story is truly inspiring how <laughs> you actually step up and, and take control of your of your own life, the things that you love doing. So I really can't wait to see how you continue to shape the future of the business and technology world in general. And I appreciate your time and energy also. Um I can spend my whole day with you and I'll just never go to sleep. We should, <laughs> we should chat. We should chat again. I know I, I could seriously, I probably got into like 2% of everything I do, but <laughs> I, I hope I did a good job at, at covering everything. And for those listening, I hope that you learned something today about DAOs, about web three and understanding your why, because that's really important at the end of the day. Thank you for listening to female founders podcast. That's it for this week episode. Be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast app. 
or connect with us on warmail.com so that you don't miss our next episode. See you next time. Bye for now.